<clears throat> Hello everyone. My name is Shakti Prasad and I'm your host today. I'm the head of content at Peru and I run the Procurement Espresso magazine. I welcome you all to the second edition of Espresso Live, an online thought leadership forum featuring procurement leaders and practitioners. Before I get started with the session, just a few housekeeping rules to be kept in mind. All the participants will be on listen only mode for the entire duration of the webinar. We will take up the questions at the end of the presentation, but we would encourage our attendees to key in their questions anytime during the session. Please type them into the question box given in your control panel. There could be a lag of a few seconds in between the transition of slides. So please bear with us. If you have any difficulty in joining the webinar, please try to log back in or key in your queries in the Q&A box and we will try to help you. Now, I'm happy to introduce two industry veterans, Tom Linton, Senior Advisor at Flex, and Dr. Rob Hanfield, Distinguished Professor of Supply Chain at North Carolina State University. I hope you all can see both of them on the screen. Both Tom and Rob are no strangers to the world of supply chain. Many of Rob's former students at NCSU are now in key positions in large organizations across the globe, while few others have founded successful businesses. For his part, Tom has been at the forefront of supply chain and procurement ever since the 1980s, and in fact, was a pioneer in sourcing computer hardware components. He had lived in Asia for so many years as Japan and then China slowly became a major sourcing hub. The reason why we invited both of them together for this session is that they know each other very well. And in fact, I've also co-authored a book called The Living Supply Chain. I hope you all can see the book cover on your screens. I believe they're also working on another book uh, together and I suppose it's titled The Physics of Supply Chain and we can expect its release uh, very soon. Given their global experience, both Tom and Rob are well positioned to discuss whether the US-China trade war and the COVID-19 pandemic has put a check on unfettered globalization. I'm done with my somewhat lengthy introduction and now let's get started on the discussion. Next slide, please. The golden era of globalization was between 1990 and 2015. And here's my first question to you both. What were the economic and business reasons that enabled China to grab a major share of manufacturing supplies? Over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here this morning with Tom. Um, yeah, when we when we look at what happened in China, you know, I think it was a combination of things. The communist government during that period uh, really began to embrace a free market system, albeit under a, a single government. And uh, there was a huge amount of investment on the part of the communist government, uh, capital investment uh, at very low uh, interest rates or in, you know, no interest rates in some cases. Uh, for major segments, and the government basically identified, you know, chemicals and, um, you know, uh, uh, manufacturing, and and a lot of the initial investment during that period was for, you know, high volume, uh, low cost commodity goods, um, and and initially that was just that it was it was seen as a place for you know, uh, commodities, uh, and and uh, high volume goods. Uh, right around 1999 or so, there was a there was a switch, and I actually had an opportunity to go to Shanghai with a group of executives from General Motors then, and uh, that's when they were starting to build Buicks uh, in a, uh, a partnership with Shanghai Automotive. They were building Buicks for um, uh, the uh, you know the the Chinese market essentially, and that's where we started to see the evolution towards. Uh, you know, more assembly, more complex operations. And um, initially those Buick plants <clears throat> uh, in China were bringing goods or parts over from uh, the US. And eventually those, those not only were those factories 
uh, buying parts locally in China, but the Chinese parts were also being shipped to U.S. plants uh, in, in, in North America. So I think we saw a movement or an escalation from sort of low-cost manufacturing <clears throat> to uh, an ability to um, move towards more complex goods, but, but also in the electronics sector, it, it really took off. And, and assembly, you know, uh, semiconductors assembly uh, were areas that, again, started to move up. And, and I think if you look at, you know, the work by Clay Christensen, he talks about the fact that, you know, there's, there's this, this evolution as, or as industries become uh, invested in higher and higher value added kinds of operations. And eventually they take over, um, you know, the entire operation, they take over the entire industry, which is what China did is, is just what everything today is made in China for, for one reason or another. I know Tom, you've had a lot of experience over there as well. And, Sure, probably mimics your experience as well. Yeah, I uh, I first moved to Asia in 1987 for IBM, and uh, at the time, um, IBM uh, was starting to ride the the rapid rise in the personal computer, and the problem was the sourcing that had been done historically was primarily into Japan, and uh, to a certain extent, small bits and pieces went to Taiwan. In Singapore and Hong Kong, but they were primarily more the labor, not the not the technology. But you know, I often say cost is like water. You put it on, if you if you pour glass on the floor, it'll always go to the lowest point. So labor arbitrage was a huge uh, advantage that China had because the cost of labor was so low, and most electronics required some level of final assembly, even if the components themselves or the technology themselves was coming from a first world country. So, so that whole process of needing to grow uh, the requirements of electronics and assembly really expanded uh, dramatically. Um, China first wanted state-owned enterprises to uh, have a stake in each one of the uh, companies that was coming from the West. So a lot of joint ventures were formed, uh, and that became the seeds for uh, how things developed. For example, um, uh, in the case of China, I mean, uh, IBM partnered with uh, First Great Wall Computer and then Legend. Legend, of course, uh, and that whole operation, which developed in Shenzhen, became Lenovo uh, when IBM sold it. So, so the seeds really were started by some uh, some very strong efforts to uh, capture some of the cost advantages. Um, and uh, of course, as we know now, looking back, hundreds of millions of people were lifted out of poverty as a result of this huge influx of investment from the West, really driven by capitalism, uh, driven by the need to. Uh, to drive down cost for you know things like the personal computer, which were much more cost sensitive than say mainframes, um, and um, and then of course all the monitors and components and cables and connectors and um, and now of course services, everything that surrounds the industry, which became the internet and World Wide Web. So the internet then had a second wave of, of development, and on it went. So I, I think that uh, China's um, the whole rise was really um, was driven by. Uh, competitiveness that China offered, then they proved to be a highly productive country. Um, you know, very, uh, you know, things that are done in China are done very efficiently, very productively, uh, very cost effectively, as well as now high quality. So, so China actually took every possible advantage of the situation in, uh, in the 80s and 90s to actually, uh, the timing was perfect for them to develop their economy. And I anticipate um, when, when people study what China did, um, you know, the lessons for countries other other countries, especially looking at Africa in the future, um, some parts of the Middle East and Europe, where they could actually, you know, duplicate some of these, uh, some of these, uh, some of these models. Okay, uh, thank you, Rob and Tom. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah, excessive globalization uh, led to pushback within the U.S., uh, leading to the election of uh, President Trump uh, and the Brexit vote in the U.K. Soon after his electoral victory, uh, President Trump uh, sparked the trade war. What has happened to the U.S.-China uh, trade lately? Uh, let's bring up the chart in the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. The trend line shows decreasing goods import from China into the U.S. What inference do you draw from the trend? Yeah, so I, I, I think, you know, this trend is, is obviously shows... Um, you know, there's a decreasing trend in terms of the number of imports from China, <clears throat> and that that does reflect the uh, the policies of of the Trump administration. And uh, we're certainly not going to get into any politics on this on this call. 
Um, you know, in some respects, um, I think Trump did push back uh, against a lot of the IP theft that um, China was, um, <clears throat> you know, was responsible for. And, uh, you know, there's a book, uh, Poorly Made in China, that, that shows that, you know, the idea of copying things is actually inherent in the Chinese culture, you know, going back, you know, thousands of years. And so Chinese are very good at, at taking, you know, an idea or an innovation and copying it and making it better. And, and uh, so part of that pushback was against the, the theft of IP. Uh, there also has been a, a tremendous counterfeit uh, problem in a lot of the uh, 80 to 90% of the goods confiscated by US Customs are, uh, are from China or Hong Kong. So there's, there's, uh, there's definitely some pushback there. Um, I think that, the, you know, a lot of people say that, that you know, Trump caused this. And I, I think Trump was really the tip of the iceberg. I think you know, a lot of the trends towards uh, pushing back against China um, has, has been coming for years. And it's not so much just a xenophobic uh, thing. It's, it's also, you know, the, the idea that we, we have these longer lead times, um, that, you know, there are some, some sustainability issues that, that come into play. Uh, there's the IP issue. Um, I, th I think the way the tariffs were uh, deployed you know, maybe wasn't the best idea. So for instance, um, you know, it hurt a lot of farmers in the US. Uh, the US pushed back with their own tariffs uh, against, um, against soybeans, uh, against a lot of proteins like, like, like uh, pork and chicken. And that, that hurt a lot of farmers uh, at a time when the, the industry was, was really smarting to begin with from, from low prices. Um, and uh, so the Chinese simply went elsewhere. They went to Brazil and, uh, you know, they may not come back to, to the U.S., uh, at least for some of those farming products. Um, I think that, that there's also been sort of a, uh, an ongoing trend here that uh, we're moving towards a much more localized world. And we're going to spend a little more time on that later this, this, uh, uh, in this webinar. But, but I think there's also a recognition that these long lead times and the, the long transportation costs uh, are, are making it less uh, profitable or less um, appealing to source from China. Plus, as, as China has grown itself, uh, labor costs have gone up significantly in China. So um, it's not as much of an advantage. You know, there isn't like a 25% you know, cost differential anymore. It's more like you know, five or ten percent, which which may not be uh, you know be worth it. So I think there's a variety of factors that have uh, you know led to this this reduction in the trade gap, and we're likely to see more of it. Um, I think in the future. I don't think this is a short-term trend. I think it's a longer term trend. Tom. Yeah, about uh, about actually a year ago, I was interviewed by the Economist magazine for a special edition they were doing on supply chain in July and. For those students and people interested in it, um, it was a 12-page supplement in The Economist. I think it's on the on, uh, public domain now, um, which was very fascinating because what's really interesting now is um, two things I said. That, you know, the headline they used in the article was, uh, the world is not flat. Um, with all respects to Thomas Friedman, who wrote a book called The World is Flat, um, what, I, what I was suggesting was at the time we were heading into a post-global world. And I said that, and obviously it took, it, 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 they used a lot of space to kind of, you know, flag that as a comment, but I didn't say globalization is dead, but what's happening is the world is transitioning to a very, uh, a very strong center of, of regionalization. Um, you know, the United States, obviously with Mexico is already, uh, at, at that, that's kind of been moving and it could expand with Canada and others. Um, um, look at China, China for uh, North Asia and its, its sector is all, already a huge um, economic um, block, if you will. The EU and others, Brexit's just a, a, a symptom of, you know, the, the throes of tension that surround this. And um, this concept of post, a post-global world uh, really means that, you know, the rise of capabilities in each region, like China now doesn't have to source much in the U.S., U.S. doesn't have to source that much in China because costs have equalized around the world. The reason the trade balance is happening, some of it is political, but I would argue that this trend was already uh, coming. In fact, I was talking to Nikkei Weekly and, uh, and, I, and I used an example. I took a glass of water and I filled it halfway up with water. And I said, just pretend water is cost. And what happens now if you add cost 
all of a sudden you get to the point where it climbs. And all Trump did was really, he, he added 25% more water and the glass overflowed. So the tipping point with China was already at a very delicate level. Um, so when the, when the tariffs came in, whether it be 10% or 20%, 25%, it really just caused the tipping point to move very quickly towards regional and local. So my argument is that uh, the post-global world is, is, is upon us. When we look back at this era, um, COVID will probably just accelerate that movement um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, different industries have different reasons. Um, but you're going to see um, uh, you know, also the rise of digital communications like this um, are actually going to have a big part of how the new world order is going to operate. Um, and I think this pandemic will be an era defining moment. It will be a time when we look back and say, um, you know, like horses and, and cars were shared the roads for about a decade. It's kind of like analog and digital, we shared the roads. And now the world's gonna go 100% digital and it's gonna move in an accelerated fashion and a post-global uh, uh, trend like we see on the slide is gonna be, I think, more and more uh, more and more likely as company as countries start to um, satisfy their own requirements within their own regions as much as they can. There'll be there'll be continue to be globalization will never totally go away, but it won't be the huge imbalances that we saw for the last uh, 20, uh, 20, 30 years. Okay, uh, thank you. Can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, now perhaps uh, this is the big question of the day. Uh, we are all waiting for your viewpoints on this one. Will the tariffs go away if Democratic Party nominee Joe Biden wins the presidential elections this November? Yeah, so I, I, I promised I wasn't going to get uh, into any political discussions on this. And, uh, you know, um, you know we've, 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 we've talked to a number of people that have different predictions. And, and some people predict that Trump is going to, you know, be able to use his base to come back. And others... Uh, Others may say no. It's the, uh, the presence in the uh, the next election will be greater than the last one, and Biden will win. So, who knows? We can't we can't predict that. We're not pundits, um, but we can, I think, talk about localization and this trend towards localization. Um, you know, people have been dealing with these tariffs for uh, you know now for for th two or three years, and um, they're finding ways around them. And so, um, you know, some of those are. Uh, you know, starting to develop local suppliers. I, I think that, you know, there's some industries where you just can't, uh, you know, you know, buy some something local. There, you know, there are some industries in China that they just have a very strong presence. So, you know, I talked to one executive who said, you know, brake pads, there's four manufacturers of brake pads in China, uh, all in the same province. Uh, and they produce 80% of the world's brake pads. You know, you're not going to find a new brake pad supplier overnight. Uh, who can produce locally. So um, in some cases, I think some of these tariffs will just be uh, integrated into people's balance sheets and, and will be you know, uh, part of doing business and will be integrated into the prices that people pay. Um, I think there is going to be some regulatory requirements that will focus more on localization or local content. Um, and that is a function to some extent of, of, of COVID. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more PPE, uh, you know, face masks and so on. Um, ventilators, you know, GM is, is now producing ventilators uh, locally, and I'm going to be talking with some, some folks on that. Uh, so I think there's definitely a trend towards uh, moving towards a more localized supply base. And it's going to take some time. I mean, for once, once a company is in a, in a country, it takes them about five years to extract themselves. And, and find a new supplier in another location. So it's not gonna happen overnight. Um, and I think that in general, people are um, in the US are, are very sort of uh, anti-China right now. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, it can happen in all industries. And, uh, you know, I think one time, you know, Steve Jobs said to uh, President Obama, you know, we will never produce Apple products uh, in the US. And it, it had to do with cost. But it also had to do with the fact that, you know, in terms of execution, uh, companies like Foxconn are just so strong and good at, at executing in China. They can bring out a new product overnight and, and deliver it, you know, everywhere around the world the next day. And, uh, you know, we don't have that level of execution in some cases 
um, that, that uh, China can. Um, but I think we're starting to also see, you know, movement to other countries as well. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and I also think we will see more opening up of borders between Canada and Mexico. And, and I know we're going to discuss that a little bit as well. Tom? Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that um, a lot of people around the world don't fully appreciate at times is the U.S. is a, uh, a three-part government. So we have the executive branch, which is headed by the president. We have a Congress, which is uh, where it makes the laws uh, of the land. And then we have a judiciary, which really is the court system, including the U.S. Supreme Court. And I would anticipate that um, certain things that are issues today with China will continue to be issues no matter who's president, because things like, for example, intellectual property, there's a lot of stuff moving through the court systems right now that has to do with how IP is not being protected in China. I would anticipate the courts will make some very clear and big rulings in this area. Um, you know, and then secondly, uh, the legislature, right? The, every congressman or senator in the United States is actually reflecting a constituency. When you look at the U.S., the number of U.S. senators is actually distributed not by population. So, you know, large states that don't have much going on, uh, you know, in terms of uh, industrial base, you know, say in the Midwest or, you know, the, the, the far, uh, the mid, 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 middle part of the country, they have a very strong agricultural and, and, and light industrial base where a lot of those uh, people are hurting because of job loss to China. So politically, the U.S. Senate's always going to be more conservative um, than, uh, and, and they have the ability to control uh, a lot of the laws that are made, even if the, the legislature, which is a Congress, of the United States were to pass things it has to go through the Senate before the president signs. So this balance of power, as it's called, uh, is something people don't appreciate as much outside the country because obviously they get caught up in the Trump politics or the Biden politics. But the U.S. is going to be continuing to move towards protecting its interests as China will move to protect its interests. Um, and I can and I think that's that's fair game. I think from a business uh, person standpoint, um, you know, business generally rides um, on another wave um, based on the interest of their stockholders or stakeholders if they're a private company. And I would anticipate that, uh, you know, things will move uh, in and out of China, in and out of the United States. Mexico right now is a huge recipient of things that are leaving the U.S. because the U.S. is one of the largest markets in the world. It's currently the largest, but, it, you know, that size of the market means that when you move to Mexico, in a supply chain guy, um, I'm really in favor of regionalization. Regionalization is better. When I mean, who wants to ship things all over the world for the time and cost involved? Uh, it's really just a big cash drain on companies to do so. So if you can find things that are marginally total landed cost competitive in Mexico and move them into the United States, that's a faster, shorter supply chain, and therefore it's better overall. Likewise in China, China doesn't want to have to buy things in the United States and ship them all the way to China when they can, if they can find it uh, within uh, you know, a shorter distance uh, to China, whether it be in China itself or in Southeast Asia and places like that. So, so I think the, the, the trend line um, for November will, it, it, I mean, things will change in terms of the emotions, uh, maybe more the tone, um, but I'm not sure directions of a post-global trend uh, that we talked about in the earlier question uh, will really change that much uh, in uh, 2021, 22. Okay, uh, thank you, Tom, Rob. That's a, that was a very comprehensive answer. And thanks for uh, answering this question despite uh, your initial apprehensions about taking a politically sensitive question. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this uh, leads us to two more questions. In fact, one is very much related to uh, Rob's point about manufacturing supply chains uh, coming back to the US. So the first question is, as the trade war and the global pandemic accelerated the drive towards localization of supply chains? And secondly, uh, how much of manufacturing supply chains will come back to the US? So I, you know, I, I think um, I, I think we're definitely going to see, uh, first of all, uh, like I said, increased localization um, because of the pandemic on certain certain categories of of um, of, of goods. And, um, you know, I think we're going to see legislation. Um, I know there's already a Democratic bill right now that's going forward around 
um, the strategic national stockpile and developing local content. Um, it's one thing to, to say that's going to happen. Another, you can't just snap your fingers and start start producing stuff locally. Um, I do think also that we're going to see, it, you know, as Tom mentioned, uh, localization. It may not be all in the U.S. Um, the, uh, you know, we, we talked about the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. You know, Mexico has, uh, is already a huge destination for automotive, um, for, for electronics, um, and I think that that will continue to expand. I mean, Mexico has uh, relatively lower cost labor than the U.S., um, Canada has, uh, you know, plethora of, of natural resources that are are next door. If we can ever figure out how to how to transport it um, and, and get around some of the uh, uh, the issues there, and the U.S. has, let's face it, a, a lot of capital uh, that that's ready to to uh, money that's that's looking for a good place to land. So so I think you know that combination is is very powerful, and I think we'll start to see. Um, you know, as, as Tom discussed in his uh, Economist article, more of a pan-North American uh, localization where uh, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico is uh, are, are really working together. And I've, I've been down to Mexico to Saltillo and these places uh, in some of the manufacturing sites, and, and they're extremely productive. Um, you know, the, the workforce there is is excellent, and, um, and, and it's an ideal manufacturing site. And uh, I've seen a lot of stuff. Caterpillar moved a lot of their production from China to, to Mexico years ago uh, because it was that much more effective. And, you know, it's it's you can get the, a truck there in a day. If you need to visit a factory, you can be there the same day. And if, and if you speak Spanish, it's even better. Right. So so there's a lot of benefits to having that that local presence. Um, and, and you don't have all as many of the issues with with IP and, and counterfeiting and everything else that, that uh, are involved in, in that local presence. Um, I, I think, you know, we're, we're going to start to see some shifts as well. Um, today, a lot of manu U.S. manufacturing involves importing components from China. And we've even seen this with, with ventilator parts, uh, with masks, you know, with, with a lot of the healthcare uh, chemicals, the reagents for testing kits that we're working on. Uh, and I've been on the front lines of the uh, uh, the COVID crisis uh, supply chain for the last few weeks, and and that's what we're seeing is a, a lot of the raw materials and chemicals uh, required for even testing kits come from places like China. So I think it's really going to turn us upside down, which I think we're we're really going to rethink uh, U.S. manufacturing and localization, and it has to go down several tiers. Um, you know, if, if we really want access, we, we need to rethink this. A great example was, you know, 3M masks. Um, you know, during the pandemic, 3M could not export masks um, out, of, uh, out of China, even though they were produced in their facilities. So, you know, you don't think about that when you outsource to a, 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 a country halfway around the world. These, these export controls and import controls are, are going to impact supply chains. And uh, even though you may request the order, it may not get there for one reason or another. Um, and, and so if we're going to rethink this, these supply chains, we have to rethink, are we going to, you know, uh, develop parts locally? Are we going to have local uh, production? And, and some automotive companies, notably Honda and Toyota, have really embraced that. So when they opened a, a Honda factory in, in Ohio, they co-located a lot of their suppliers in, you know, Ohio uh, farm fields and and had them local um, because they really wanted that local presence from a working capital perspective, but also from a relationship perspective, from a quality perspective. There's a number of reasons why you want to have that local presence and that local relationship with your key suppliers. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, I think um, I think U.S. manufacturing has kind of got itself in a in, in a bit of a problem area because. Uh, a lot of the things that U.S. used to make now are made other places. So to move it back is not, as Rob said, it's not. It's just you just can't do it easily. It's not. Uh, it, it's it, you know there's there's uh, training, there's uh, skills, there's capital equipment, there's many things involved with uh, just snapping your fingers and saying I'm going to manufacture in the United States when it moved out of the United States, you know, 20 years ago or or even longer in some cases. Um, but I do think that um, this trend line of regionalization, you know, countries 
um, that U.S. manufacturing will um, take advantage of. Not only Mexico, but Costa Rica is coming on. They have large industrial park capabilities. Uh, keep your eye on the future on places like Cuba, Puerto Rico, um, that aren't that far away. And, and you know, there's going to be even more development within low-cost areas of the United States. What many people around the world don't fully appreciate is they call it the United States for a reason. There are 50 separate sovereign states. Uh, and sovereign, they have their own governor, um, they operate independently, they compete with one another for jobs. Uh, you know, it's very common now to see where the, next, the Texas governor is competing now with Michigan, trying to move people out of uh, companies out of Michigan into Texas. Um, I think it was uh, Ian, uh, Elon Musk famously here just about a week or two ago said, you know, he was pulling out of California and going to Texas and Nevada. Um, some of that's for tax reasons, some of that's for political, I mean, there's a lot of reasons behind it, but, but there's 50 sovereign states in these United States um, that actually compete. So there's going to be low-cost areas in the United States that are going to win jobs. Um, uh, you know, uh, South Carolina has been very successful. Um, you know, obviously, Florida has been successful for some reasons. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot of movement out of the Northeast, specifically into the West-Southwest. Um, California, again, to the South-Southwest. A big region of economic power within the United States and the Americas will be the Texas, Mexico, um, you know, that whole area for manufacturing is going to be booming um, over the next 10 years. So U.S. manufacturing has many flavors. Um, it even has regional sub flavors. And uh, there will be winners in the United States, there will be losers in the United States. Um, but in general, it's, it's not easy to move things, whether it's locally or far away. And uh, as Rob pointed out, you know, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's a many years uh, uh, transition, but I think it's in full swing. Um, a lot of people right now are looking at Vietnam uh, as an alternative to China. Uh, and Vietnam obviously has advantages of low cost, productive labor force, plentiful labor force. Um, and of course, as we all know, India. Uh, India has been the kind of the, the office of the world for a long time. And things like the pandemic should help India because it just proves the point that, um, you know, remote workforces uh, can operate very successfully. Uh, they don't all need to be sitting um, in the United States. So I think companies that operate out of India uh, could be big advantages. Philippines is another. Uh, thanks, uh, Tom and Rob. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, I think. Uh, we, we touched upon this uh, topic extensively in your previous answers. Mr. can we move to the next slide? Yeah, so what are the advantages of localization, uh, gentlemen? Can you elaborate on each of those pointers? Yeah, so in our, uh, our, our, we, our new book that we're working on, um, we have a first draft ready that, that there's a, a chapter in there called uh, compression. And, and again, you know, we talked about the physics of supply chain and um, you know, Tom and I spent a lot of time thinking about what that means in terms of the compression of supply chains and, and compression is just that, you know, when you compress things, um, you know, you, you, uh, you bring them together and, and you, there's, there's pressure to do that. Um, but there are some significant advantages of compressions of supply chains. The first is, um, as you point out, it's, it's not as far away. And so you, you can have, um, you know, increased collaboration, uh, innovation occurs when people get together and, and talk about things and, and tinker. Um, and maybe in a post COVID world, you know, that may happen more online, but I think there's still some benefit from being in the same time zone. Uh, and, and even, you know, working in a lab side by side with, with key suppliers to make that happen from a production standpoint. Um, you know, working capital, I think, is is you know the new um, the new darling of of, of P and L. Um, you know, finance now recognizes that working capital optimization is is really important. We've seen a whole you know group of supply chain finance uh, uh, fintechs come out that are focused on this. But you know, if if you can also have less material on boats, uh, in in uh, on ports, in in uh, on carriers. Um, you know, it's not traveling as far, you have less transportation costs, but basically, which means you have less inventory. If you have less inventory, uh, you have less stuff that's sitting around um, or, or being moved. And that in turn leads to uh, increased cash flow. And, and cash is king. I mean, if you have greater cash, uh, especially in a, in a COVID situation, you know, a lot of 
small businesses just don't have that much cash laying around. Uh, so, so cash truly is king, I think, in this next uh, post-COVID era. Um, and so there are really some significant benefits associated with this this compression that you know we talk about a little bit more in our our book, Tom. Yeah, just to kind of reinforce what Rob is saying, you know, this concept of flow um, is really important in um, supply chains. So friction is the enemy of flow, uh, and it slows things down. And obviously, if you're dealing with ports and imports and exports. Uh, and long transit times across oceans and airplanes and airports, um, that's friction uh, in a supply chain. So if you really want to optimize uh, for flow, you really want to think about things that are local or, or close to you. Um, you know, we all know that you, you buy food at the market, it's fresher, it's better if it's closer, uh, but, but also um, when you're buying technology or you're buying products or hardware, anything, um, you know, it's generally uh, going to be more more current, better um, if it's local, uh, if it's nearby. So, so localization is always should be preferred uh, when sourcing, uh, but uh, regionalization would be second. Globalization actually would be third. Uh, for some reason, globalization became a big, uh, you know, kind of like if you're global, you're good. If you're local, you're bad. I don't know how that happened over the last 30 years, but that's opposite actually what what it should be. Um, local should always be preferable to regional and regional should be preferable to global. So, and that's just, um, you know, whether you're talking to your balance sheet, cash flow, as Rob pointed out, or, you know, on your financials, um, customer satisfaction, you know, mass customization, omni-channel optimization, um, you know, you can actually get closer you are to your customer, the more likely you are to give them what they want, when they want, how they want. So, um, localization, um, um, it actually helps with many things. And as you point out, uh, collaboration innovations is one of them. Free, free cash flow is another. Uh, and, and just how much, uh, how much money you need to optimize or put into the system uh, in order to create something. Um, so, so in places that are going to rise, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I anticipate just like China, India is going to have a, long, uh, a large opportunity to develop localization uh, for its consumption. Uh, Indonesia is another you, you, huge population centers in both cases, um, and those population centers are going to demand more um, for the same reasons that China and the West actually wanted more. So, so I think um, you know the rise of this, the, where government needs to get their act together, in, in like Indonesia and India, India is also in the area of just infrastructure, developing what China did, um, really strong infrastructure. I went in 80, 88, I went to China in Shanghai Dirt Road. Uh, now it's a megapolis with some of the best infrastructure and roads in the world. So this kind of transition has to occur in some of these countries to actually bring the full benefits of uh, of localization. Uh, thanks, so, so Tom and Rob. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah. So which industries will see shifting of supply chains uh, away from China? Uh, that is uh, localization and by when do you think it will happen? So I think, um, you know, if we look at what's the way things are going, um, you know, clearly Amazon has had a massive impact on um, on the way that people buy things and, and the way that consumers uh, buy things. And I think um, it was, as we discussed previously, this idea of localization enables um, that. And, and, and consumers are impatient. You know, they want it now. They want it the way they want it, um, exactly the way they want it, and they want it now. So I think we're 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 going to see, you know, definitely some new technologies that um, will facilitate that uh, that consumer requirement. First, I think we're going to see, um, you know, the increased digitization of certain kinds of manufacturing. Um, we're working on a project looking at uh, digital print technologies, you know, where you can order uh, order a T-shirt with, you know, like your name on it or a specific logo that you've designed or uh, a running shoe. And be able to uh, ship and manufacture and produce it, you know, within within days. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's a capability that that we'll see come out. I think we're seeing. Um, I've been working on some panels. There's some huge, um, there's huge growth in terms of additive manufacturing right now. Um, they're they're seeing some components like nasal swabs was one, but a number of others um, where uh, where you know 3D printing has really taken off. And I think we're going to see, you know, increased volume of, of those kinds of technologies 
that will uh, you know start to facilitate that. And then um, I think you know from a national security perspective, our uh, Department of Defense and uh, uh, our uh, you know uh, FDA and and uh, uh, DHS I think are going to start um, developing suppliers for things like PPE, um, you know, critical medicines and so on. And I think the pharmaceutical sector is is going to be have to be ready to respond to that as well to set up you know contract manufacturing sites um, here in the U.S. or or locally um, that is is are closer to the customer from a national security standpoint, I think will will become more important. Um, and I think we'll see that ac across the globe. I think we'll see, you know, some of these industries um, start to localize and start to uh, respond, you know, due to uh, regulatory requirements, local content requirements, um, country of origin requirements. And I think all of that will start to shift in that direction. Tom, any thoughts? Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, I hate to put a clock on this, um, <clears throat> you know, because, it, because the, 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 the danger is every industry, there's 18 major industries in the world, uh, and they all take different lengths of time to do things. Obviously, there's going to be a crisis around medical supplies. I mean, that's, that's going to be like front and center. I bet it even gets legislated or whatever to, to move certain things. Uh, I mean, the U.S. shouldn't have to uh, wait on uh, China to decide when we can have N95 masks, for example, or ventilators. So I think that kind of thing will happen. Um, that's true of any country, by the way. Uh, when one country is holding captive uh, and trade um, another for their own personal reasons. So um, I think some things will move quickly. Um, but I want to touch on, you know, the sub-level politics that occur too. I mean, TSMC just recently announced a move of uh, building a foundry in the United States. Um, they're significant and they control two thirds or more of the world's semiconductor fabulous companies because they produce the, the, the wafers um, that actually are inside most of the modules and, and chipsets that are, uh, are purchased today. Um, you know, it's, it's really a, uh, an outsourced manufacturing model for semiconductor uh, raw, uh, the wafer. Uh, and the chips themselves. So, so by you know, and but they're predominantly in Xinchu, Taiwan, which is you know northeast of Taipei, um, and they've have expanded into uh, other geographies, China, Thailand, um, to name a few. So they um, their move into expansion of the United States is a reflection of of just the business requirements and also political tensions uh, between Taiwan and China. I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of this kind of thing that's going to happen. This is just one case, but uh, we're going to see more. Uh, high tech will be easier to move actually than low tech. Um, you know, you know, you know, trying to convince uh, a lot of 18 to 35 year olds uh, in the United States that they want to sit at a bench and assemble, uh, you know, electronic devices eight hours or more a day is not going to be an easy sell. Um, uh, where you know people who are lifting themselves out of poverty and have no other options really those kind of jobs and, and, and mass have been a part of China's growth. Um, so I, I anticipate um, I anticipate localization will um, take its own time, country by country, industry by industry, and uh, it will. Uh, it, the world, as I said, the headline of the Economist article last July, the world is not flat. It will be bumpy, um, you know, but over time it will equal out. Um, you know, if you, you know, if you shake a, if you shake a, a can of soda, you know, too hard, it blows up. But uh, eventually, the bubbles die down, and I think that's what's going to happen here. I think the world is going to is going to level off. Costs are going to grow in equalization. Um, Africa for the next generation is going to be a big opportunity. Um, you know, most people don't realize the country of Nigeria's population will be larger than the United States in 2050. Uh, Nigeria will be larger than the United States. And so, and, and Africa is primarily French speaking. Um, so there could be, um, you know, you've got, you know, major language shifts going on. Uh, French in Africa, uh, Spanish in uh, North America, China and Chinese, uh, obviously in, in North Asia. So um, I think this is, this is gonna be really fascinating. I, I almost wish I had my career to do all over again, uh, cause it's gonna be fun. A good point, Tom. Uh, can we move to slide 14, please, in the interest of time? Uh, we'll cut to chase. Wait, the next one. Yeah. 
Uh, this slide is self-explanatory and most of our audience are from the procurement background. So what is the role of procurement in localization? So, so I think, you know, obviously, um, you know, I think this whole COVID and, and trade war has is, is really forced us to rethink uh, total cost of ownership. And I think, you know, as we said, working capital is going to become much more important from a digital perspective. You know, having uh, visibility into where your material is in the supply chain is going to be more important. And, and you know, with, with longer supply chains stretching out across the world, there's, there's greater risk. You, know, you don't know what's going on around there. And we're, and we're working with other agencies like Resilink, um, and we're looking at, at some of the data flows there around supply chain risk and how it's impacting uh, sourcing uh, issues. So, uh, you know, I think, I think there are um, a few options. Number one, um, there are certainly other regions of the world. You know, Tom mentioned India. <clears throat> um, you know, a lot of the apparel sector is moving to uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, some of these Southeast Asia places. Um, but again, there's there's risk. You know, and every country has its own level of risk. And so I think um, you know you almost have to you know look at all these different risks and and weigh them out somehow. And um, you know you don't have a crystal ball. You don't know what's going on. But if if you look at you know maybe paying a little bit more uh, and having something produced locally and it's a, a more stable supply base or at least a more stable source. Um, you know, maybe consumers are, are also going to be willing to pay a little bit more for that, um, and and you might have to uh, you might have to charge a little bit more, and and I think that you know consumers are going to become much more aware, uh, and they're going to value uh, transparency. They're going to want to know where their food is is produced. They're going to want to know where their apparel or their garment is is produced. Is it produced in a fair factory? Um, I think those kinds of sustainability issues are. Uh, much more on the radar of particularly young consumers, millennials, and now technology is going to allow us to be able to sort of see those kinds of things and answer those kinds of questions. And, um, you know, in general, people aren't going to want to pay more, but um, I, I think there is a trade-off. And, and part of the challenge for industry is going to be figuring out how much more can they charge, you know, to cover those additional costs of localization, because they're, they're definitely going to be higher costs. Um, there may be a trade-off there with with the working capital, with with the uh, inventory and the supply chain. You know, right now a lot of the cost systems don't really capture that. So I think you know procurement has a real opportunity to step up here and uh, really be a, a core part of of that decision making team. Uh, and I think these are board level issues that 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 uh, where procurement can start to make an impact and say, you know, let's let's. You know, let's show you the numbers. Let's let's you know give you visibility into what's happening. Let's help you understand you know what those true costs are, and how it impacts our balance sheet, how it impacts our financial statement, and and uh, what it means for the financials. And uh, you know, you got to give people options. And uh, I think that's the number one thing that procurement can do is is to step up and and give people options and and make it uh, you know based on real data, not based on guesses or you know, big assumptions, but 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 show the numbers and, uh, and and give people some of the options that they need to take. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, I would uh, ex just expand on that a little bit. I think um, you know uh, Thomas Edson, the, the, he's the CPO of Bayer, and uh, and also Unilever is, is in this. But this whole idea of sustainability and procurement. Um, you know, um, Bayer uh, started this sustainable procurement pledge where CPOs and procurement organizations around the world really focus on developing sustainable supply chains. Well, sustainable supply chains and su sustainable sourcing tends to be more local than global. Um, it doesn't have to be. I mean, things like fair trade with Starbucks and others have created ways by which you can actually create these consortia of how, how you buy fruits and vegetables, how you buy coffee, how you buy food in general. Um, whether it be organic or not organic, this whole idea of localization tends to um, tends to be more around um, has a sustainability flavor to it uh, when it comes down to certain parts of uh, food supply chains or even medical supply chains, pharmaceutical supply chains. So, so localization kind of has that shift to it. Um, obviously, you can't localize iron ore if you don't have iron ore. Um, you know, there's certain things that come from certain places. Um, and I think Rob pointed out earlier, even in China, 
you know, there's certain things that come from there. Uh, you know, when the mask tried to move back, well, the mask, you know, you couldn't move it back. You didn't have the mask and they were over in China. So, so there's a lot of things that um, procurement can do. But I would say the number one thing is understand um, what the future of a transparent procurement supply chain looks like. Um, transparency is very different than just having visibility. Transparency means that you know exactly every tier of your supply chain. You have visibility from a risk standpoint through multiple levels of your procurement. Um, you can go buy something um, and you think it's locally sourced, but maybe 90% of it is actually coming from some other country and some other place you don't even know about. Um, and obviously that carries on in the future, um, more liabilities. Um, you got to know uh, now, there's no excuse. Um, you got to know uh, the DNA of your procurement. You got to know, uh, you know, you know how uh, in the humans they map the genome. Well, we have to map the genome of a product or a service that we buy. You got to know that uh, persons assembling it are not under the age of whatever country age is is appropriate, 16, 18, whatever the, uh, the age is. You got to know um, that it's 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 not uh, going through money laundering. You got to know. Um, that the materials that are in it are not contaminated in some way. You got to know these things. There's no excuse for it. You just can't take it um, at face level. So localization, again, proximity uh, favors distance when you're doing these kinds of things. You know, you can send people over to take a look. Um, a little more difficult um, if it's uh, you know on the other side of the world. So, so I think risk management uh, is huge and going to be bigger. Uh, as a result of the COVID thing, nobody questions the need to understand it, but it's understanding and mapping layers of your uh, procurement uh, that's going to be the next uh, big wave uh, in the world. Yeah, Tom, I can give an example. You know, we we had a, a PhD student do some work on apparel in in Bangladesh, and you know, on an eight dollar T-shirt, a typical cotton T-shirt, um, the wages, average wages paid to workers was eight cents in Bangladesh. And uh, this was based on, you know, TCOs of all their factories and shipping costs and everything else. And the cost to uh, be able to produce that garment uh, at a living wage for that worker would increase the price by 14 cents. So, yeah. you know, the question is, would it, how much more would it, would it really cost to pay a fair living wage for someone in Bangladesh? 14 cents. I think most people would pay that for an $8 t-shirt. Right. Oh, that's, that was a very insightful um, response from both of both of you. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, can you, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, I think uh, Tom pretty much answered what all procurement needs to do in the future. Because the question here is, uh, what are the skills uh, will they require in the future? But Tom gave a long list of what procurement should know uh, in order to carry out this localization strategy successfully uh we have about uh, 10 to 12 minutes perhaps we can take a couple of audience questions uh would it be okay tom rob or do you want to bell on the slide more sure we can take some questions okay so the first question is uh, from naveen tomar how do you see india as a strategic destination uh, in global supply chains i mean i can understand the sentiment uh, because uh, there's a lot of talk here in India about uh, gaining a lot of investments from China. Uh, what do you what do you, what do you think? Yeah, so I think I think Modi came out. Uh, there was an article in the Economist that also talked about this. How Modi came out and said that India is the next uh, supply chain destination for the world, and uh, uh, that this is an opportunity to capitalize on you know the weaknesses that China has has shown, the anti-Chinese sentiment um, in the Western world. Um, the, the fact is, I think um, India is still a difficult place to work in. Um, there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy. Uh, you know, a lot of the regions are have, have local regulations. Um, there's some very old sort of socialist type structures that make it difficult for people to operate. Um, infrastructure is, is is challenging. So there's there's risks in India like anywhere else. Um, I think that you know as a destination for a back office it's been it's been very productive uh, but for it to become sort of the next manufacturing hub um you know there's there's issues there um and while i can't speak directly to those um i think there's there's 
you know, the number one barrier is going to be the regulatory environment is going to have to be much more streamlined. Um, and, uh, and, and I think, you know, giving people some standards to work around uh, and guidelines. Uh, supply chain executives hate uncertainty. Um, they hate it when things get caught up in customs and can't get released or, you know, there's, there's you know, tariff taxes or tariffs that, that pop up out of nowhere. Uh, those kinds of things have to be addressed if, if India wants to be the next, uh, the next destination for, for manufacturing. Tom? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, India, not unlike the United States, is um, broken down into you know, different uh, different regions that subregions, which all have their own politics. Um, you know, I've been uh, to Chennai in that area several times. I've been to obviously Mumbai, Pune several times, in Delhi, uh, in the north several times, and 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 uh, you know they compete uh, for business as well. Um, and I think the ones that have the best infrastructure early will win more business than those that don't. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think India's got infrastructure challenges that really need to be uh, overcome and fixed. But like the United States with a democracy, it's not easy to pull that stuff off um, because everybody's got a, 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 a notion of what it should be. Everybody's got a say in what it can be. And unlike centrally controlled state governments, which can actually implement things um, by fiat, uh, it's a little more challenging in India. Um, but having said that, you know, if you look at certain regions, especially in the east, north of Chennai and around Chennai, I think uh, around Delhi and Mumbai and Pune, I kind of look at that as kind of like the Boston of India, right? A lot of, a lot of uh, universities, like a lot of, uh, a lot of students, a lot of academia. Um, um, a lot of services developing there. I think there's going to be certain sectors that will develop in different ways depending on on the industry. Maybe a little bit more in fact, a little more manufacturing in the east, um, a little bit more services in the west, and obviously Delhi uh, being an, more of an economic power uh, maybe in in the country. But I think it'll be more that flavor uh, in India. Uh, thank you, Tom and uh, Rob. Uh, the questions are flowing thick and fast but unfortunately we are uh, running out of time would it be okay to take one more question a couple more sure you can take one more yeah yeah okay so how do you this is from lauren chevalier how do you see evolution of meta enterprises such as amazon that is managing goods services and tomorrow do you think uh, companies like amazon will be a game changer yeah i i, I think um I think that's going to just continue to continue to grow. Um, I think you know people have been using Amazon more than ever uh, during the COVID crisis, and um, you know it already is a game changer. And I think if you look around, you can see um, the big investment right now is in um, warehouses and distribution centers. You know, when I I drive down um, you know out of Raleigh on uh, I-40, I see a huge Amazon warehouse that's being constructed right outside the city. And um, you know this is happening all over the country in, in major major cities and areas, and it's happening because um, people want next day delivery or same day delivery. I can order an Amazon a lot of times and get same day. So there's there's um, th you know people are getting used to that, and once you give it to people, uh, you can't take it away. And um, you know that's going to be that's going to continue to grow, and I think it's going to reshape the way that. Uh, people buy. We're already seeing a, a big demise in a lot of the, you know, brick and mortar retailers um, in the U.S. J.C. Penney's, Macy's are, 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 you know, really struggling right now, and uh, Williams and Sonoma. I think we're going to continue to see that online market continue to grow, and um, you know, the the one issue with that, of course, is the infrastructure around logistics. Uh, there's going to be more trucks on the road, more deliveries, and. Uh, I don't know if our logistics infrastructure is going to be able to handle it, and that's that's another issue for discussion on another day. Tom. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, as Rob and I touched on in our first book, you know, and there's a cheetah on the cover for a reason, um, and that is there seems to be one universal truth when it comes to supply chain and sourcing, and that is speed wins. So the faster things go uh, in the supply chain and in servicing people in the supply chain those companies, those locations, those processes will win over those that are slow. So if speed wins, 
then um, it doesn't take much intelligence to figure out why Amazon is putting distribution centers. I have one opening up less than 10 miles from where I live, a very large one. Um, why they're populating the world with distribution centers around major metropolitan and, and population centers. Because the flywheel effect, as Amazon calls it, is all about maximizing the speed by which customers' needs are met quickly. So anybody who does that, um, you know, if you're looking for an investment thesis for yourself, <laughs> focus on companies that focus on speed, focus on getting things faster, doing things better that way, and probably more, a little more regional, a little more local, um, and, uh, and you can see why those business models favor the digital age when people can get what they want just by typing it in uh, and asking for it uh, as soon as possible. So um, that would be, I think, the way I would, I would end it. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Tom and Rob. Uh, that was a very insightful session on uh, localization of uh, supply chains. Uh, we have received uh, several more interesting questions, uh, but unfortunately, we are run out of time. Uh, we will try and reply by email to all, all the questions uh, that are not answered in uh, today's session. Uh, this marks the end of our session. A big thank you to all the participants for logging in today, and we'll be sharing the webinar recording link with all of you soon. Uh, please do reach out uh, to the email address on the screen. Uh, next slide. Uh, I've given my email address over there. Please do reach out to the email address on the screen if you have uh, any additional questions. But thank you uh, and have a good day. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody.